inside your glory, we give our hearts fully to you. And we cry, holy, holy are you. And we cry. are satisfied by you. Your love is our reward, is why we ask for more of you. And we cry, oh. Taken by the wonder of you. Here inside your glory, we give our lives fully. Precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. Good to me. 
Well, good morning, good morning. It's good to have you with us this morning. Yeah, we're going to forego announcements, and we have a wonderful blessing to be a part of a baby dedication this morning. So we are going to, to have Hannah and James George. Would you go ahead and come on forward? And, and yeah, I know... Yeah, blessed are the cries of the baby. That's first, um, first Balonians four seventeen. So. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, that's that's amazing. Look at that little one. Yeah. And we also have another uh, baby, uh, the Dadus, the um, Alfred and uh, Andrea Dadu will have their newborn come on up here. She's running a little late, so she might just join us right in midstream. So <laughs> we're okay with that. Well, we have before us here Zahara Joan George. Three weeks old, is that about right? Yeah. Three weeks old. And this is Hannah and James George. James is in the Marines, right? He will be shipped out <laughs> soon. Yeah. He will be shipped out soon on the 24th, I believe it is, uh, what I was told at least. And um, that is, uh, so it's like, let's do it now, right? Let's dedicate this baby to the Lord. Now, just a few words about a baby dedication and what it is and what it's not. You see, what it's not is we're not Christianizing Zahara and inducting her into the church. That's not what's happening. You see, she's going to have to make up her own mind in the future. And that's where people kind of get what dedications are and what they're not kind of confused because there are certain movements under the Christian umbrella that baptize inf infants by sprinkling and they Christianize them and induct them into the church. You see, baptism is a reflection of what has already happened in the inside of your heart. The faith that you've already placed in Jesus Christ, the baptism is an act of obedience or a public demonstration of that wonderful spiritual new birth being born again. So we don't baptize infants, but we do dedicate them to the Lord. You see, that's biblical. You know, you look to Luke chapter 2, you see that after Jesus was born, he was brought to the temple and he was uh, presented to the Lord. And look at this. Oh, the dad dudes are here. Good to see you, Andrea. I know you've been rushing this morning. And we have Andrea and Alfred and little Antonio. Yeah, give me some. Come on, come on you got to do that right. There you go. <laughs> High five. And then we have Annalise Hadassah Dadu here. Now, how old is Annalise now? Uh, four and a half months. Four and a half months. That is amazing. And I was about to say after Luke 2, when Jesus was presented to the Lord at the temple, that Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 presented Samuel to the Lord. And he said, not one razor will touch its head. And I was thinking, Annalise here is getting a head start on that little <laughs> promise. And what an amazing, beautiful thing to have these two babies here today. You know, Psalm 127 tells us that children are a heritage of the Lord. They're a gift of God. So I wanted to ask you to join me in agreeing with me in praying for these two children, these two newborns. And, but I do want to ask both couples a question. Do you promise to provide a safe and secure atmosphere, Mr. and Mrs. George, that is conducive to raising up little Zahara in the admonition and the word of the Lord, yes. you do. The dad dues, do you promise to provide that condition, the environment to raise up and dedicate little Annalise to the Lord? Man, that is great, I'd love to hear that. Would you join with me, just agree in prayer for these two. Lord, we just thank you for Zahara and Annalise, Lord. We thank you and dedicate them to you this morning, Lord. We present them to you as children with dreams and life and plans for the future. Lord, we know that you open doors and shut doors and we pray that you would bless these children as they learn about you from their parents, Lord, as the environment is conducive for the word of God and for modeling as being an example to these two babies. Lord, we praise you. We thank you so much for what you're gonna do and we ask that you would open up doors that they would be filled with the Spirit in the future as they commit themselves to you. Lord, make yourself known to both of them early. Lord, use their life and so much that you want to do through them. Lord, we ask that you would protect them and, 
and help them to grow and to come into contact with other believers so that they might understand who you are and come into that wonderful relationship in the near future, Lord. Lord, I pray for these marriages, and I also pray for their family. Lord Jesus, that we as a body of Christ will come around, rally around them, and, and help them and encourage them in all things in the Lord and in the word of God, Lord, that these two babies would grow up in your admonition, Lord. Let them be blessed by you because the parents have put you first in their lives, Lord. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Would, would any of you like to say anything? Would you like to say anything? You're good? <laughs> We're good. Okay. Well, good. Well, let's all stand together and we'll begin to worship the Lord together. All right. Thank you so much, guys. So that's an example for us. We're to come to the Lord as a child. Vulnerable, trusting, and being brought up under the parenting of our God or our King. It's so good to know that we have Christians that are having kids and during these times and all, it's God's gonna raise up an army. So we bring up the children in the way that they should go. They will not depart from it, even when their hair goes gray. Praise the Lord for that. And so we are at this time in an interesting time period. It's a good time period because we can rise up in power and authority in the name of Jesus. And so we're going to sing this first song. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. We're going to be those that stand strong and proclaim the coming of our Lord. Amen. of great trial a famine and darkness and sword still we are the voice in the desert crying prepare ye the way of the Lord behold he comes riding on the clouds shining like the sun at the trumpet call lift your voice it's year of jubilee now to Zion soon, salvation comes. Amen. And these are the days of Ezekiel. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of the servant David rebuilding a temple. These are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide as your world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your of Jubilee, now to Zion's hill, salvation comes, behold he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's here a 
of Jubilee. Now to Zion to let's sing that again, proclaim it. He comes, behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, He's shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee. Now to Zion to salvation come. Now to Zion to salvation come. Now to Zion to salvation come. Oh so, yeah, He comes. Bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord. We are those, God, that wait upon you. Those that wait upon you shall renew their strength. Rise up with wings as eagles. They will not be weary when they walk, but when they run. Going in the strength of the Lord, God. We wait upon you, Lord, for the power of come on high. To renew us, to strengthen your church, Lord. For your name is glorious. Your name is holy. up a chosen generation that will march through the land all of creation is longing for your unveiling of power Would you release your anointing? Oh God, let this be the hour. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go forth from here to the nation. Let your fragrance rest in this place as we gather to seek your faith. Ruler of the nations, the world has yet to see. The church in victory, yes. Turn to us, Lord, and touch us. Make us strong in your might. Overcome our weakness. That we could stand up and fight. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go forth from here to the nations. Let your fragrance rest in this place. As we to seek your favor. Amen. Let your glory fall. Let your glory fall in this room. Let it go forth from here to the nations. Let your fragrance rest in this place, so oh Lord. To seek your face as we gather to seek 
grace does abound upon us. Lord, we thank you for that grace that is inexhaustible. You've allowed us to receive you by that grace. You've transformed us by your grace, and you will do something in the future. You'll work in us. You'll use us by your grace. Your grace makes everything possible. And Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We ask that you would bless our service today that you would descend with your Holy Spirit upon this place, giving us understanding and conviction. Lord, apply the truths of your word to our lives. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, and, and we want to glorify you this morning as we worship together as a body. So, Lord, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated, and junior high and high school can be dismissed to their groups. 
And boy, what a beautiful time it was at our second Saturday yesterday. <clears throat> I never knew James could put an Oreo on his forehead and trickle it down the front of his face and catch it in his mouth. I never knew I could put an Oreo on my forehead, flip it up in the air, and catch it in my mouth either. I'm just discovering all kinds of spiritual gifts that I never knew I had. <laughs> so God is so good. He is so good. Well, we'll be in the Gospel of Mark again. Let's turn to Mark chapter 9. We'll be in verses 30 through 50. And if you remember earlier in chapter 9, Jesus ascended Mount Hermon in the north part of Israel to transfigure himself before the disciples, Peter, James, and John, that spectacular moment where Christ's deity radiated through his humanity. And then, of course, they came down the mountain, and what was waiting for them was a dispute between the Pharisees and the disciples. The disciples had failed to cast out a demon from a possessed boy, and a desperate father pleaded to Jesus for help. Of course, Jesus helped him. He cast out the demon and so forth, and, and then he went on to tell them that there's suffering and death and then resurrection ahead for him, there in Jerusalem, and Peter would have nothing uh, to do with that. He rebukes Jesus, and Jesus had to rebuke Peter. Those rebukes flying everywhere, and, and ultimately you had <clears throat> Jesus launching into a teaching about faith and prayer, about suffering that awaits those who are his, and that this faith and prayer would see them through those hard and difficult times that were coming like Jesus' time that was rapidly approaching at the cross. And then we finally come here to, you know, chapter 9 and verse 30, and we see that they departed from there. Now, there is Caesarea Philippi at the base of Mount Hermon in the northern part of Israel, and they passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. So Jesus' public ministry in the Galilee, in the north, by the sea, was over. This would be the end of it. He would stay temporarily in Capernaum, where he would teach the disciples, and then he would make his way down to Jerusalem and never return to the Galilee again. He would be put to death on the cross in just several weeks later. And so what we have here in verse 31, Mark tells us the reason why Jesus didn't want anybody to know that he was there in the Galilee. It says, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. So Jesus wanted to take the opportunity going through the Galilee on his way to Capernaum actually before he launched off to Jerusalem was to have private instruction with his disciples. He wanted to, again, address their messianic expectations, which were way off base, and to solidify these key principles of the kingdom of God. And so their understanding needed to be developed. And Jesus took this time immediately before he was about to leave them and he wanted to instruct the him and Peter especially and the rest of them and even us foreshadowing the church coming on down to our time today in not only what the kingdom was going to be about, namely to enter it, you enter it through many tribulations and suffering, but also the way of the kingdom. You see, the means of the kingdom, what the kingdom is like. And so he takes this time to reiterate to them that the Son of Man will be betrayed by men. He will suffer, they will kill him, and ultimately he'll rise again on the third day. You see, Jesus needed them to understand this primary truth, that there was a reason in God's plan and in his foreknowledge why he would go to the cross, why he would have to die. And in Acts 2.23, it says it was the predetermined plan by the foreknowledge of God that Christ went to the cross. That's the primary truth that he needed to understand. And, but for them, it was simply inconceivable of a Messiah being put to death. 
You see, their whole expectation was, as I said before, was totally off. You know, they expected Jesus to overthrow the Roman government, to set up his kingdom there and then, not to go and die, not to talk about this suffering nonsense, according to, according to them. So Jesus is preparing the disciples for the shock of his death. They weren't quite there yet but they're gonna to have to endure something that they never expected would happen. Even though Jesus warned them time and time again, the plot to kill Jesus was already underway. It had already been hatched by the religious leaders. They knew what they would do when Jesus came down for the Passover into Jerusalem. And ultimately, they would put him to death. Now, I think the reason why he continues to remind the disciples here is not only to help their understanding, <clears throat> but also to let them know that this wasn't simply an unfortunate circumstance that Jesus got caught up into by being placed on the cross, that this was actually the foreknowledge of God working itself out. It was the predetermined plan of the Father for him to die for the sins of humanity. And it wasn't some, oh, this was unfortunate, he went at the wrong time, uh, this is something that he just got caught up into in a net of circumstances and just, oh, well, this is a fluke that they killed Jesus. No, Jesus told them ahead of time so that they would know that it was planned. And then the same thing happens for us. Um, God has told us that we enter the kingdom through much trials and suffering. And when those trials come knocking at your door, they, they, they're at your doorstep. Just know that it was Christ's death that led to his glory. And it's your trials that will lead you to glorify God. To, you know, explain and to display and to model as an example for everybody around you to see what God is like, especially how you deal with your trials and tribulations. You know, like I said before, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves that the way to glory is to deny yourself, is to say no to sin, say no to the flesh, to take up your cross and follow Christ. And Jesus had to get through to the disciples before this time where he would be placed on the cross. But notice their response, what they felt in their heart, what they thought in verse 32, but they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him, so they understood Jesus' power over death. They saw Lazarus being raised from the tomb. They saw Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead. But what troubled them and what they didn't understand is if Jesus was put to death, who was going to raise him? You see, the resurrector is now in need of another resurrector, if you will. And so they didn't understand how, first of all, the Messiah could die. And, and now if the resurrector is being put to death, who's going to raise him up? But notice they were afraid and ultimately didn't ask him. You know, they, he, they, they don't want to talk about it because probably they don't maybe want to show how maybe ignorant they were or whatever it might be. Or maybe they simply didn't understand it because they couldn't receive it. You see, sometimes we read through the scriptures and we love the precious promises, but when we come to things that are convicting in us, we put up this little bit of a mental block saying, I go no further. You know, we, we tend to pick and choose maybe what we like from Scripture and what we don't like from Scripture. And that can be detrimental to your spiritual health because as Paul said to the Ephesian elders, I have not denied to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God because it's not only those encouraging precious promises that are good for us, it's also the conviction and the challenges that you and I need to have too. And maybe it was the disciples' case here that it's not so much that they didn't understand, they couldn't comport it or put it in their existing expectations and figure out how this can all possibly be true. The psychologists call that cognitive dissonance. <laughs> how is all this going to work itself out. But if this is true, then this can't be true. And, and they were somewhat confused. Even the angel, after Jesus rose from the dead, says, do you not remember what he told you? That he must suffer and die and then rise again on the third day? They were still reminding them. 
even after Jesus was put to death and so forth. So you have this confusion on the part of the disciples. And as we come to verse 33, he's going to address the disciples' dispute about greatness. After he tells them that I'm going to die here soon, they start bickering with each other about who's greatest in God's kingdom. <laughs> wow. Okay. Verse 33. Then he came to Capernaum, that's in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee there, and his headquarters, that's where Jesus' adoptive home was. Remember, he was born in Bethlehem, moved to Nazareth to be raised, and then moved from Nazareth over to Capernaum for his ministry headquarters. Even Peter and Andrew used to live in Bethsaida, and they moved ultimately to make their home in Capernaum as well. It's the same place. And when he was in the house, most likely this is Peter's house in Capernaum, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road. So as they were traveling from Caesarea Philippi, they began to dispute with one another on their way to Capernaum, who ultimately is the greatest. But what was their response to Jesus' question? They kept silent. For on the road, they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the 12, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and a servant of all. You see, God's kingdom is an upside-down kingdom, or I even should say it's a right-side-up kingdom. You know, it's upside-down to our world from their perspective, but it's right-side-up to his people. To serve people is the quickest way to be honored and glorified by the Lord. That is what he commands the people who enter the kingdom. That's the way of the kingdom is service. It's being a servant, to serve your neighbor and so forth. But notice they kept silent. Most likely they kept silent because they were embarrassed about uh, Jesus knowing what they were probably talking about. By this time, the, they probably thought that Jesus already knew. If he asked the question, he already is coming in with some knowledge uh, they've learned after three years of, of being with Jesus. And the apostles don't look good, do they? They don't look at in chapter 9 at all. Between Peter, let's build three tabernacles, and the disciples can't cast out a demon, and now you come and you find that they're bickering about who's the greatest. Mark chapter 9 is the low point of the disciples in Scripture, it appears to be. And then you can add Peter's denial of the Lord uh, during his trials and so forth. And so notice um, he, he says that they were silent, but they have disputed. Now, it's, it's interesting that this dispution comes after the deliverance of the boy was demon-possessed and, and the transfiguration and so forth. And, but it tells us that if they're discussing greatness, who's the greatest? No, I'm the greatest. That pride destroys unity. It really does. If they were disputing with one another, there were disagreements in that discussion. And that means that their pride of who is the greatest among them all is something that destroys that unifying principle. You see, the Holy Spirit dwells in each one of his people and they come together in a unified body called the church. You see, he lives in you. He works through his people and so forth. And then ultimately you find that this wonderful unity can be destroyed very easily by simply bickering with somebody or a brother or sister over how great you are. It's just basically pride. Who's the greatest? And notice he sits down in verse 35. That's the posture of teaching. He wants to communicate something very important to them about this issue. So he called the 12 disciples and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, to be first in rank, so to speak, then you need to be a servant of all. So Jesus doesn't rebuke the concept of greatness here. It's very important we understand that there's nothing intrinsically evil about greatness. You know, our, our society has the goat in sports, the greatest of all time, you know, and they have all these different categories of, of greatness. But in God's kingdom, it's okay to be great, but it's not what the world thinks it is. You see, the disciples, if they were bickering over the greatness of each one of them, they still had that idea of the worldly concept of greatness, to have power, to have authority, to have the limelight. 
you know, to be put up on a pedestal, to receive all the accolades, to, to be the one that's the lights, action, camera are on you. It's all about you. That's the worldly concept of greatness. But Jesus already described here in verse 35, what is the kingdom's concept of greatness? And that is to be the lowest of all. The one that washes the feet. The one that serves another brother or sister. Somebody whose rights are wrapped up into their master's rights. A servant, a slave, if you will. You see, that's why much of our culture doesn't embrace the gospel that we read about, that you and I have believed in, is because it goes in the polar opposite direction of the worldly concept of greatness. And by recognizing that Jesus is dealing with a flawed you know, concept that the disciples had of this, he helps them to understand what greatness is in his kingdom. And he'll very soon shift to using a little child as an illustration or as an object lesson to communicate that. But Jesus' teaching on human greatness is simply counterintuitive to what the world thinks greatness is. You see, the disciples only had the Pharisees and the Sadducees to look at as a model of greatness, besides the Lord, of course. You see, they spelled greatness as, I would rather be called rabbi. I want to be seen in the sight of men. You know, that we are of the elite group, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. That they wanted to be seen in their prayers. They wanted to be seen in all this stuff. And so this concept of greatness was beginning to infect the disciples' concept of what it means to be great in God's kingdom. They were in jeopardy of losing the Christ-like character that Jesus was teaching them the whole time. And so Jesus is not going to waste this moment and not deal with this issue because this issue is so, so very important. You know, true greatness is not seeking to lord it over people, but to serve people. Jesus is defining what truly matters in God's heart, what truly he values among his people, what he truly desires in the people that are part of the kingdom of heaven. And this is what the disciples needed to learn. You know, but, but Jesus here is not only speaking to the disciples to groom them, he's looked down the corridors of time, the centuries in the future of all church leaders, of all Christians, anybody in leadership especially, to understand that the kingdom's concept of greatness is that you will decrease and Christ will increase. That you will serve and not put yourself on a pedestal to be noticed or to be seen or to given the accolades or to be patted on the back every time. You see, a servant doesn't look for those things. A servant serves according to the will of the master. And that's what Jesus wants to communicate to them. But unfortunately, the church struggled with this, especially in the apostolic era, the early church and so forth. There arose false teachers that would creep in unawares, according to Jude, and they would... Uh, you know, raise up in, in power, and then they would start to lead the believers astray. They would start to teach them false doctrine. The heresies would start to come up, but they also would financially bilk the people. They would say, oh, you need to mix Judaism with Christianity and so forth, therefore stumbling the faith of those sincere believers who they have been given charge over so many things that Paul says and Jude says are to address this concept that this apostate teacher's office, so to speak, wherever it may exist, is something that falls prey to this greatness problem. It was pride at the root of it. It was to elevate oneself and so forth. And so this notion of greatness had to be corrected and they had to understand this fact because Jesus was going about to ready to hang on a cross. And if they still had that idea of greatness the way they had it here, and they see Jesus hanging on the cross, you're not great. You're hanging on a cross. Instead of seeing it as being first in God's kingdom, of being a sacrifice for all, according to the will of the Father. You see, that's an important thing. And they could easily stumble at this point, especially when Jesus is going to go through his trials 
and not be aware that what Jesus was doing was modeling for them what it means to be the greatest in God's kingdom, to be a servant of all. And then in verse 36, Jesus is going to illustrate this teaching by using a little child. In fact, this could even be Peter's little child in his house that he's using about who is greatest in God's kingdom. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken his, him in his arms and said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So here you have this wonderful you know, statement about receiving little children, a child. And the word receive here is decatai. It means to welcome into one's home. It means to embrace them with a hug. It means to, hey, come on in, open that door, come on in, let me serve you, so to speak. And so Jesus is talking about this wonderful reception of the child. And when you receive a child, this profound reality is something the disciples had to understand. When you receive this person, you're receiving me. You see, to receive somebody else in Christ's name, especially believers, you have received Christ himself. And this whole concept of greatness is all wrapped up in this. By using a little child as an object lesson, Jesus is referring to the most powerless, the lowest, the most insignificant, the least important members of society in the Roman and Greco-Roman culture. They didn't have much rights, per se. They didn't achieve anything. They were dependent upon their parents. This was the lowest of the low in terms of the family unit. Nobody gives much stock to children. Yes, we appreciate it. We pinch their cheeks, right? But ultimately, they were of the least significant. So Jesus is saying here, basically, that you need to receive the least significant among you, the least of importance, because the disciples at this time would be tempted to describe these unimportant ones in the church or in the body of Christ as someone lesser than themselves. And this, again, would be fueled by their mistaken concept of greatness. You see, but Jesus is saying he cares for everybody. He cares not only for this little child as the lesson that he's using, he cares for all the little ones. And I know that lots of children's ministries and, and use this, this passage to you know, um, engender a heart for children as they you know, go into the ministry for them and so forth. And rightly, it should because it does have application there. But I think more importantly, Jesus is trying to communicate to them that it's these little ones within the church it's the least important among us. It's those that are most dependent. Those who we are tempted to think as unimportant in a way. Those are the people that Jesus is caring and concerning about here because this term little ones, literally you could use it, the word in the sense of who are deemed insignificant, little ones. So the little ones here are all throughout our passage. In fact, here in verse 36, the little child, or those who are mentioned by John in verse 38, he says we forbid them to minister because he was not of us or not for us or not of our group, so to speak. That's talking about a little one as well. Or if you go to you know, verse 41 where someone gives the apostles water in Jesus' name, that is a little one as well. That insignificant, many are, you know, prone to say, giving somebody a cup of water. He says, those are the people I want you to serve. These are the people that are important for you to understand that greatness is achieved by receiving these little ones. It could be anybody, any one of us that are the common person, the person that doesn't have much status, and the disciples, by disputing this greatness issue, were in jeopardy of losing the heart of what the kingdom was all about. 
You see, and we can do the same thing too. We can always want to, you know, we want to hang out with the, the, the rich and famous or we want to hang out with the popular. We want to, you know, be with this or that group and we form cliques because it's the in crowd and so forth. We can do that even within the church. But Jesus is saying, get rid of that thinking altogether because I died not only for you, but I died for the least among us. I died for the little ones, anybody who is deemed to be either by the disciples or any one of us as insignificant. We know that there's no insignificant people in the church, but we have that, we run that risk of jeopardizing how the kingdom operates and what God's heart is all about by placing ourselves in this greatest category and we're preoccupied with it. So in all the passages that we're talking about where the little ones are mentioned, I think he's referring to common people, not people with a status apostle or disciple in the, in the terms of the 12 in this way. It's talking about everybody within the body of Christ and these little ones were, were valuable to Jesus. Now, this I think is confirmed in a parallel passage in Matthew 18. Notice what he says. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Notice he came to save these little ones as well. Not just talking about physical children. He's talking about the insignificant among us. Put little brackets around the insignificant or deemed to be so. And... What a beautiful uh, statement that is because Jesus is basically teaching the disciples to don't consider anyone unworthy of salvation or anyone unworthy of being served by you or anyone unworthy of being used by the Lord. You see, we can run into that so, so easily and whoever receives this little ones, these apparently insignificant people within the church, receives not me, it should be not me only, but also you receive him who sent me. So the value system doesn't stop with Jesus, it goes all the way to the Father. This is the Father's heart for the kingdom, and this is what the disciples needed to learn, they needed to tweak their understanding of what greatness was. But in verse 38, Jesus addresses the worldly understanding of greatness, you know, and ultimately it causes division, exclusion, exclusivism, within the body of Christ. Notice in verse 38, now John answered him saying, teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he does not follow us. Now, John was probably the youngest of the 12. He was probably a teenager when he was called by the Lord, maybe in his early 20s, possibly. And certainly Jesus' teaching here prompted John to maybe feel a sense of conviction in his heart that the Holy Spirit might have been working on him to, to bring up this thing that may have been troubling him. And notice what he says. He says, we forbade him because he does not follow us. So John is basically excluding from service that person who was acting in the name of the Lord, as the following verses will clarify for us. That he was acting in the name of the Lord, but you don't follow us. There's this cliquish group that's being formed. And if the disciples and the leadership within the church say, hey, you can't be used. You're not one of us. You're not in our group. You don't go to our church. You can't do that. You know, that church is down the way. You, you guys go down that way, but don't, don't come here and, and try to work in the name of the Lord. <laughs> God forbid, you know, that happens. But John obviously sensed that something was wrong, but Jesus didn't want them to fall into the trap of the Pharisees' view of greatness, elevating themselves above all others, excluding others from, from holiness and so forth, uh, that your group is better than another group. And remember, Jesus had previously sent out 70 before, not just the 12, he sent out 70 others outside of the 12 who were ministering in his name and sharing the gospel and healing the sick, you know, and casting out demons and so forth. The church is a lot bigger than you think. 
it is not just Calvary Chapel Temecula. This is the local church. The universal church is all around the world. Your brothers and sisters exist with the Holy Spirit living in them and ministering in Christ's name all over the place. I mean, this is what Paul tried to correct to the Corinthian church, which is a carnal church there in Greece. He said, some of you are saying, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, I am of Christ. And they form these little cliques and little chapters within the church there at Corinth. And they were doing the exact same thing as what in spirit or in, in principle John was doing here by forbidding people to work, you know, in the name of Christ. It causes that sectarianism. It causes a kind of a denominationalism to take place. Now, I have nothing against denominations as so far as they are for the unity of the body of Christ, but, you know, if they overemphasize secondary doctrines to the exclusion of the body of Christ that causes divisions, then I do take issue with that. Um, but, but here, I think it's important that the disciples learn it's not the Pharisaic type of greatness. It's not the Pharisaical or religious leaders type of legalism. That's what um, they should be chasing after and so forth. It is not the spirit of sectarianism. It's not the divisions within the body of Christ, but that's what happens when you begin to bicker about greatness. And so I love what G. Campbell Morgan, uh, the great expositor in England in the last hundred years, he said, the more spiritual a man is, the less denominational he is. That man recognizes that the body of Christ is universal. The Lord lives in the great and the common who are in his name. The German Lutheran theologian of the 17th century, Rupert Meldinius, said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And that's the spirit of what Meldinius had said is what I think Jesus is trying to communicate to them. Now, we're not saying that we can't say we have to be separate from you if there's a doctrinal error. He's talking about Christian service in this point. But if there is a heresy, if there's doctrinal error, of course we have to make divisions. There must be a separation between those who don't believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God or have a divine nature, or that salvation comes from works and so forth. Yes, we need to make a radical division. It's important that we preserve the truthfulness of God's word and what he's trying to teach his church but not to the exclusion of service. Yes, if they're a heretic, we don't involve them in the service of the local body. But within the orthodox body, the correct doctrinal thinking body, we should not exclude each other from service. Everything should be open to God's people. And I know that there's different giftings and callings and so forth, and that's all worked out under that umbrella. But we see now in verse 39, Jesus is going to expand the disciples' view of the kingdom to include the little people, the common people. But Jesus says, do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. So no one by the Holy Spirit can call Christ accursed, the Bible says. If this man cast out a demon in the name of Christ, then that means the Holy Spirit was working through that man to perform that exorcism. And that man who was used by the Holy Spirit can't just turn around and say Christ is bogus or a fraud because it's the same spirit that lives in that man that directed him to exorcise that demonic spirit from the individual is the same man that lives in him when he makes statements about Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit cannot call Jesus a curse. So what he's saying basically is, if this person was not for us, not of us, he would have failed in that exorcism. He would have disqualified himself without any word from you. He would have been bounced out, so to speak. Remember the sons of Sceva in and, and the book of Acts, how they you know, wanted that power to cast out demons as more of a, a token of a business proposition or to make money and, and this and this and that 
And you know what happened to them. They got torn up, didn't they? It was evident for everybody the Holy Spirit was not working through the sons of Sceva. And so you have this, this word from the Lord that for he who is not against us is on our side. There's more than just you 12 working in the name of Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, Uncle Harry that says, you know, okay, you're a Christian, good. I'm not going to come against that. It doesn't mean Uncle Harry's going to heaven just because he doesn't actively fight against Christ or overtly and obviously, you know, condemn him and so forth. He has to make his own decision ultimately for Christ. But in the context of Christian service, as we see that we're in, then those people who profess the name of Jesus, who are believers, who are doing things in Christ's name, we should not forbid them to do that, you know, unless it contradicts scripture, unless it contradicts sound doctrine. So in verse 41, notice, for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So notice this seemingly minor act of humility. This is a little one again, bringing a cup of water to the disciples in his name, to drink in my name because you belong to Christ. This means that God has raised up people everywhere to serve brothers and sisters. That this, this little one who, who gives this cup of water, so to speak, there's all kinds of humble acts that should, we should aspire to, to enter into God's kingdom and to be reward, rewarded for it. And that is an eternal reward. Notice, he will by no means lose his reward. They will not lose their reward because in serving fellow believers, they are serving Christ. This is the great instruction on steering clear of a human concept, a natural concept of greatness. You see, the reward will go to this humble act of simply giving a cup of water. That's what Jesus wants us to do with each other. He wants us to serve one another, even if it's simply a humble act of saying, are you thirsty? That's what's being great in God's kingdom. That's what the disciples needed to know, not to elevate themselves above each other and so forth, but to be like this little one, to enter the kingdom of heaven like a child. Matthew 19 says, you know, bring the child, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God is made of such as these. And it's talking about that wonderful simplicity of serving and not seeing yourself as important, but as a child. And this is a wonderful concept that Jesus has to drive home and if it's done in his name, notice, in my name, then he will not lose his reward. And when it says in my name, it means that an atheist who does something good, maybe helps a lady across the street or pays the rent for somebody, it doesn't mean he's going to get a spiritual eternal reward for that. You see, it's things done in Christ's name that have the spiritual reward. That's what separates atheistic good works from Christian good works is because the Spirit of God is involved in it. It's because you're doing it for the sake of Christ. Your motivations, your intentions are different, and so forth. So we can't equate this as somebody doing simply a moral good. And then in verse 42, Jesus speaks more broadly about all God's children here. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble... It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Wow. So in other words, it's better to experience the most horrible death than to stumble the faith of these ones that some might be tempted to deem as insignificant or unimportant or a commoner in the church. You see, this is making a very heavy statement and a stern warning against any future church leadership, against the disciples here, to changing their concept of what it means to serve into greatness. Because when they do that, they will stumble the faith of the people that are here to learn about Jesus. In other words, this word stumble in the Greek is skandalizo. 
And scandalizo means to cause someone to be tripped by temptation, to fall, or were led into sin. And to stumble somebody as a church leader, to, to stumble them would mean to do something to cause them to be angry at Christ. And we can do that very easily because the disciples could adopt this pharisaical tradition in saying that you're unworthy, that you're not holy enough, that God doesn't love you or God doesn't use you or you, you break up into these cliques of the haves and the have-nots, it may disenfranchise those believers in the church. And what will they do? They think it's coming from the Lord and they will be mad at the Lord. They will get upset. You know, oh, we don't serve your kind here at this church. That church is down the street. You know, that would be a quick way to stumble the faith of the faithful seeking to come and worship the Lord with the body of Christ. You see, Jesus has to correct this problem. And it's been a problem in the church for so long. And it's really, it's not gone away. It's, it's still here today. So we need to be very careful about how we speak to people. I'm not walking on eggshells. I'm not talking about that. But just being a servant in Christ is to encourage. It's to edify. It's to build up. It's to strengthen. It's to equip each other. It's not to disparage or disenfranchise. And when we do that, we're not reflecting Christ. And it stumbles those little ones. It stumbles those who are maybe new to the faith that don't know any better. And then when we don't put a lock on that and get rid of it and, and put it away, we have them just engaged in this pharisaical, demonic activity that puts sin in the heart of a believer. And that is so serious. And Jesus takes this very seriously. And their whole discussion of greatness is all tied into what he's saying here. And the influences that, that cause many believers to stumble is everywhere. I mean, you look all around. You can look to our culture and you can look to our religious world and find that these, these stumbling practices can be very, very prevalent. In fact, in the secular world, you see it in public higher education. The Christians that go off to school and you find that the professor starts talking about Christ and that he wasn't the son of God and, you know, he disparages him and brings all his host of anti-supernatural assumptions to the teaching classroom and so forth, that could stumble the faith of a believer. You know, the, the drug cartels can stumble the faith of believers who are struggling with drug addiction. You know, prostitution. So Jesus is putting the secular world on notice here, but even more importantly, he's putting the church world on notice as well. Those who say that they are leaders within the church, he's looking down the corridors of time and speaking to all those leaders that would come and lead his people as a church leader. And, you know, the distortion of Christian values and so forth, and, and even in religious circles, even within the so-called church, we have all kinds of various things that are that can and have stumbled believers. I mean, I think about the priests that have come forward in the hundreds to, you know, say basically, okay, I was in the wrong. That went on for years, coming forward in the hundreds. <clears throat> and I get it. There, there, is, there is policies in place that, you know, that of celibacy that, don't create an environment conducive to avoiding those kind of things. Um, and I get the whole policy argument. I, I get it. But it, but it trans, even transcends policy. You know, it's, it's this stumbling that one brings to serve themselves. You see, it goes back to the greatness issue and being a servant of all. A servant does not gratify his own flesh. He puts it to death on the cross that he's supposed to be carrying. And so when people see uh, a church leader do things like this, 
it makes the people, the little ones, angry at God. They shake the fist at God. Why God? Why didn't you protect me? I will never be associated with, with Jesus Christ or the church. I know what happens in there. you know. And they can't make that distinction or differentiation between the one who committed the sin and Jesus Christ himself. And that's the rub. That's the rub. That's stumbling or causing somebody to stumble, to trip up, to doubt their faith or to disparage Jesus Christ himself because of something that one of his leaders do. You see, the disciples were, were dancing very close to that which Christ came to get rid of. You see, they were dabbling with this whole concept like the Pharisees were of greatness and, and how to be number one and, and getting rid of all the suffering and pain and death when that is the way into the kingdom. They just didn't get it. They would get it later, ultimately. But, and, and this, all, this whole thing doesn't mean we're not responsible for our own actions. You know, people, even victims of crimes and so forth of the church, so to speak, they still have to be responsible for their faith in Christ. We're not saying they get a free pass and this justifies it and, and they, you know, turn away from the Lord and so forth. But Jesus couldn't use any harsher language to address those who would cause those little ones to stumble. I mean, it is just something that he has to get straight. And then in verse 43, he emphasizes the seriousness of stumbling the faith of the little ones. This is how serious he thinks this issue is. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better that you enter the, into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into a fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. So Jesus is using metaphorical language here. It's not saying to literally cut off your hand or anything like that. He's saying cut off or get rid of, abolish anything that's preventing you from entering the kingdom, from being that servant that he's calling you to be. Get rid of it completely. Because without doing that, it does not reflect that you are actually in the body of Christ. So some people say, you know, why is he talking about hell? He's talking to the 12 here. I mean, they're, they're his guys. They're the people of faith. You know what I mean? But Jesus isn't just looking at the 12 at this point. He's looking beyond the 12 in a much more broader category throughout church history, tr through the future, in fact to apostate teachers, and so forth. And notice, it's better that you do that. It's very severe to get into eternal life and be maimed. So the metaphorical language is clear. But notice, it says, go to hell. I mean, this is Jesus' wake-up call to straighten out their priorities. And anybody's priorities that would find themselves stumbling believers. And that word hell, Gehenna, it's talking about the lake of fire. Remember Gehenna, Ge, or Ge, is valley. And Henna comes from Hinnom, which means the valley of Hinnom. It was the place they burnt trash day and night. The place where King Ahaz worshipped Molech and sacrificed his children to Molech. It was a trash dump where corruption and garbage were thrown that would never be extinguished. And so Jesus uses that phrase to talk about this. The wrecks of life are people who stumble these little ones. These are the wrecks of life. The people who stumble, the people in the pews, the people in the church, the people who are trying to figure things out, the ones that are maybe at a disadvantage as they come to the Lord and they begin to, to grow in him. And so he says that there is a result that is not good. The worm does not die. Notice the corruption never ends when you're in hell. It's like a perpetual state of decay or corruption. The fire is not quenched. So Jesus is basically saying, I'm the avengers against anyone who stumbles believers. He's warning future generations of the church all the way through here. The mentality he's not going to tolerate is what he's saying. The fire's not quenched. That means it's eternal pain and suffering. It's called torment in scripture. The affliction of pain that originates from within 
in accordance with one's will. In other words, they'll be kicking themselves with weeping and gnashing of teeth. They'll be in outer darkness. They'll be in a place where the worm never dies, the corruption, as he uses this language. In verse 45, and if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. The same metaphorical statement is here. Get rid of anything that's keeping you from entering into the kingdom. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than have two feet, to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So this isn't the first time that Jesus is using this kind of language. He spoke quite a bit about the torments of hell. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Sermon on the Mount, he will mention these kinds of things as well. And so the pain and the punishment that comes from one who does not get rid of that which prevents them from entering into the kingdom. Jesus will not tolerate it. And then for a third time, in verse 47, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And basically, all the things he mentioned here, the eye, the hands, the feet, they are our most valuable things in our body. Without those, you can't get along too well. And so he's saying that anything that you think of is a strength in your life, but that is causing you the inability to come into the kingdom of heaven or to be a servant of God, to be a leader for God, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Because isn't it the eye that entices you to sin? Isn't it the hands where the sin usually takes place? That's why he put those fingerprints right here. Didn't put them here. You put them here because this is where goodness happens and this is where sin happens, here. And the feet as well. The feet are the ones that take you to that place of sin as well. So he's saying get rid of anything, even if it's your strength, even if you're going to lose a billion dollars for getting rid of the things in your life that prevent you from being what God wants you to be, a servant of all, Get rid of it, even if it costs you that, because the alternative is much worse. It's eternal punishment. And so Jesus doesn't want to mince words, but then he follows upon the fires of hell, and he says in verse 49, for everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. So he's saying the unbeliever who fails to do those things, to get rid of those things that are preventing them from being that servant, to, for being that, the believer who is following Christ, to enter into the kingdom. He's saying, for you believers, even you believers, for the unbeliever, it's eternal torment. For the believer, he says, for everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Now, some people see this verse as kind of a puzzling verse, but we need to remember that fire and salt are both purifying agents. They're both purifying agents. That it is basically Jesus saying that he will purge and refine this attitude through trials and tribulations among his people, and that may involve suffering. That the way that you become great in God's kingdom to be a servant of all is had over time through a process of seasoning. You know, you, you think about putting your roast and you season it and for the holidays and so forth or whatever you're making, and that seasoning kind of bakes into the meat itself and it gives flavor to the meat. So Jesus is basically saying, I will purify you. I will season you with fire. And that means the trial, the tribulation, not the tribulation, of course, but tribulation in your life, through suffering, through those things that are hard to deal with. Because in doing so, you're going to be refined. It's basically saying the refiner's fire will purify you and burn the dross out of your life. And then the salt is so important because that will preserve you. 
both the refining fire, but it won't be unto death. That salt will preserve you going through those, sometimes we feel that they're horrible trials. And God will do that to, for you, to you. And he's basically taking a picture out of the Old Testament sacrificial system. You know, where is fire and salt put together? Will you look to Ezra 6 or Ezekiel 43? Even Leviticus chapter 2, it's mentioned that you, you can't put leaven on your sacrifices, picture of sin. You shouldn't put honey on your sacrifices, it tells us. But you do put salt. And most of their sacrifices, they use salt with. They, they put that salt on the sacrifices because it pictured God's enduring and preserving covenant among his people. And so the, the same thing is happening here, that as we're seasoned and we're preserved by God's value system, by his word, by his Holy Spirit, he will preserve you through these things to bring you out the other end purified. I mean, who signed up for the refiner's fire? We didn't think that when all the organ was playing and raise your hand if you love Jesus and come forward and so forth. We, we, <laughs> will we sign up for that? Yeah, you did. You did. And thank God for it because that means he loves you and he's making you ready for heaven. You see, he's making heaven ready for you. He's building a place for you and he's gonna come back. John 14 says he's gonna take you to that place, but he's also making you for heaven so you can enjoy it more, so you can be rewarded more, so you can receive of the Lord as he reveals himself to you more. See, you don't want to go to heaven as a little thimble. You want to go to heaven as a pickup truck. You know, put it in the back. You know, I want to receive of the Lord's revelation about himself to me, but we can only handle so much as finite human beings. I want to create in me a bigger potential to, to receive of the Lord's knowledge about himself to us. And so he takes this from this wonderful Old Testament picture in Leviticus 2.13. It describes the, the salt especially with the grain offering. And the grain offering symbolized uh, dedication, uh, devotion, character, as they gave it. Notice what it says. Every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Salt symbolized the presence of God his preserving character in you. And he wants you as you minister to bring that preserving character with you. He wants you to use it as you minister to the little people, you know, to those we deem maybe insignificant, wrongfully so, of course. But he wants you to be a living sacrifice, not a cause of somebody's stumbling. And, you know, oftentimes we get obsessed about our Christian liberties, don't we? We get obsessed about our rights and our liberties and we insist on exercising our rights and even to the stumbling of, of a brother or sister. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, 13, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. And the word to stumble that we read in the text is actually could be used for bait it can be used as a lure or a trap, much like you go fishing. You just put that lure out. It looks good. It looks mm, yummy, but it leads to death. You see, when you cause somebody to stumble, it's like a lure. It looks like it's from Christ, but then they finally realize it's, it's hopefully it's not, but unfortunately, some people think it is, and they begin to be bitter and disenfranchised from the Lord. They see the Lord in a whole different light. And so he's trying to prevent you from that and the disciples from that. But in verse 50, he says, salt is good. But if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. So the salt is good. It certainly is because they didn't have refrigeration back then and it was a preservative. It kept things whole. You'd sprinkle salt on your meat or fish or whatever. It would keep it together. So salt is good. But Jesus wanted them to know that you disciples are God's salt on this earth. Matthew 5, 13. 
You are his salt. You are the one that's going to bring a preservative to this earth, not corruption. You're the ones that are going to add the flavor to this earth, so to speak, those juicy things that make you hungry for more. You know, if you want, you eat salt, you get thirsty, right? We should have a salty life, a thirsty, to make people thirsty when they hear. And traditionally, when, when the church has joined itself with governmental entities or um, more of human institutions, what happens is the church loses its saltiness. It loses its flavor. And so the disciples were on the verge of losing their saltiness. And then what is saltiness good for? Preserve, right? If it serves its purpose. But if the salt wasn't processed right, if it wasn't brought together right, it loses its flavor, then it's good for nothing. You just throw it out in the trash heap. They were on that verge of losing its flavor and saltiness. And so bring that salt with you as he seasons you with that fire, as he seasons you with salt. He wants to bake it in you so you can bring that flavor to the people you're ministering to. And that means you're gonna serve the little ones. You're gonna serve the little children. You're gonna serve those people who need service in other words. So I know I kept you a little long today. You're so good. I don't see anybody squirming either. That was good. But let's take this lesson with us and um, bring it into our lives. Cut it off if it's preventing you to do so. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It only brings death and destruction. But I'm so happy that God is going to do this process in all of us. Refine us, Lord. Purify us. Make us the people that you want to, to use without stumbling anybody else in their faith. Okay, let's all stand together. And <clears throat> if you need prayer, we'll have our prayer team here for you. And as we worship, just cry out to the Lord. Open that heart and mind to the Lord and, and say, Lord, help me. Preserve me. Make me into that person that sees all the little ones as somebody worthy of your service because they are. Don't worry about the greatness. That'll happen as a natural byproduct of you serving people. He will promote you. He will bring forth what you need. So Lord, we, we thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. We, we open our hearts to you because you're the one that's gonna season, season us up. You're gonna refine us, Lord. You're gonna knock those rough edges off. You're gonna make us people who desire to serve, Lord. Make us great in your kingdom through the means that you prescribe, Lord. Not through the worldly means of power and control, but service to your people, especially at the most disadvantaged, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Your holiness is so amazing to us. We pray that you would open doors for us to exercise our saltiness, Lord, to bring this flavor and preservative to a lost and searching world that seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. So, Lord, I just thank you. We praise you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look to God. Give him praise.
Yes, Lord, you are holy, oh God. Amen. Surrender to him. Let him rule over your life. Be your Lord and Savior, your good shepherd. We'll all be in good shape. Amen, when he returns. God bless you. Love one another. Have a great week. Breath of God, breathe on me, breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me, Let's sing that again, breathe on me, breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me, breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me. Oh, wait.